Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're here today with Dr. Rex Dunham, who's going to talk to us about fish genetics and all the advances made in catfish genetics. Dr. Dunham's been working in the area of genetics for over 45 years and has been working with collaborators around the world. He specializes in a host of genetic techniques, including quantitative genetics, traditional selective breeding, molecular genetics and genomics, hybridization, transgenesis, gene editing, xenogenesis, and reproduction, mostly with catfish. He and his research have genetically transformed the catfish industry twice during his career, creating a better fish for our farmers. And with that, Rex, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be speaking to all of you today. Uh, as you can see, our topic is uh, catfish genetic enhancement, traditional and biotechnological approaches for food production while protecting the environment. Uh, we'll be primarily focusing on catfish, but uh, to complete the story, I'll also be presenting a couple of examples with other fish and uh, from other laboratories. And uh, also Dr. Klein uh, reminded me to tell you that although this is focusing on catfish, uh, all of these approaches can be used in uh, most all, not all, but most all aquatic organisms. Okay. So <clears throat> when we build a house, uh, we have, we use more than one uh, type of tool. And the same thing with genetic enhancement. Uh, we have a variety, a whole suite of genetic enhancement tools at our disposal. Ellis Prather on the far left and Homer Swingle on the far right uh, did the first catfish genetics research at Auburn University and they didn't even realize it. Uh, because at that time they were evaluating different species of catfish to see which one was best for aquaculture. And species are indeed species because of genetic differences. So when we evaluate different species, we're actually doing a, a genetic evaluation. Uh, once we've identified uh, the best species, the first step in a genetic improvement program is to identify the best performing uh, domestic strains. Uh, strains and families within strains affect the success of all genetic enhancement programs. Uh, once we've uh, finished that step, then we uh, can begin a focused genetic enhancement program. Uh, we have long-term options and short-term programs. Uh, selection for body weight's been very successful across many different species. Although this is a semi-slow process, uh, we can double body weight through about uh, eight to 10 generations of selection. Um, by 2003, because of the research done at Auburn, either through uh, direct releases or farmers learning how to do their own selection, and also the creation of some catfish uh, companies based on our research, about 70% of the industry was using uh, selectively bred channel catfish. Now, when any genetic enhancement program, if we're trying to uh, help uh, the, the farmer or the industry, we have to be aware of any, uh, you might say, side effects uh, that the program may have on other commercially important traits. In the case of selection, that's correlated responses to selection. And uh, if we uh, select to increase body weight, uh, there's some positive benefits. Uh, the fecundity increase, the carcass yield increases, disease resistance is a little bit better, but unfortunately the tolerance of low oxygen decreases. Uh, but on the other hand, we can uh, overcome that problem through uh, mechanical aeration to make sure that there's adequate oxygen in the water. Uh, <clears throat> this illustrates uh, the increase in the kilos per hectare produced by catfish farmers in 2003 versus 1980. Uh, during this time period, uh, they were able to increase production by threefold. Uh, so 
this is a, a positive impact on the environment and takes uh, pressure off of natural resources. So we're producing three times of food on the same, uh, the same footprint. Now this is due to uh, farmer innovation. We have to give them credit as well as increased farmer uh, skill, uh, but also due to impact from research. And so there's probably a significant uh, credit here due to improved uh, aeration techniques as well as uh, improvement in genetics. It corresponds with increased use of selectively bred catfish. In 1974, Roger Yant and R.O. Smitherman uh, demonstrated that in uh, commercial densities in ponds that uh, a channel female catfish cross with blue catfish males had improved growth, uh, carcass yield, and, uh, and some other traits. Over time, we learned that this particular hybrid has increased growth rate, lower feed conversion, improved disease resistance, better survival, better tolerance of low dissolved oxygen, higher harvestability, improved processing yield. And so overall, the phenotype and production the overall value is greatly improved by making this single cross. Uh, about 20 years ago or, or more, there were field trials in Alabama that showed that under farm conditions, these hybrids grew, uh, produced twice as much as channel catfish and had much better uh, feed conversion efficiency. Uh, nowadays, we have the advent, uh, the advent of uh, much more intensive catfish production, uh, increased horsepower for aeration, just a few farmers using in-pond raceways and several farmers using uh, split ponds. The hybrid is an essential component for these uh, systems to work as they have much better survival under these conditions compared to the parent species. So when we consider this whole suite of traits that are improved, uh, the US hybrid catfish is probably the best example of genetic improvement in aquaculture that there has ever been. Now, <clears throat> we can have a fish with the best genes in the world, but we're not going to be able to impact uh, the farmer unless we're able to produce adequate number of fingerlings for commercial scale use. So. In 1966, uh, John Judice and the US Fish and Wildlife Service already knew that this fish had aquaculture potential, but the reproductive isolating mechanisms between those two species uh, prevented uh, commercial scale aquaculture. So it was almost 30 years later uh, that we finally had small scale production, commercial production of hybrids. And this was based on uh, uh, common uh, carp pituitary extract technology developed at Auburn. And there was only one farm, uh, Gold Kiss, that uh, was trying this technology. So for about an eight year period, uh, we're fluctuating between a million to five million hybrid fry produced in the industry. Uh, then, uh, uh, at about 2000, we developed a, a new technology based on LHRHA induced spawning. And uh, that coupled with some other factors allowed us to double and triple uh, hybrid uh, embryo production, allowing commercial scale application finally of this great hybrid. Uh, key components included bag spawning, uh, better nutrition, uh, better hatchery and fertilization techniques. And another key factor in 2005, Auburn partnered with Eagle Aquaculture to commercialize the hybrid technology. And um, uh, that uh, gave an example that convinced other farmers that they should, uh, they should try this. Now, Eagle's very organized, uh, had a factory uh, type assembly line to produce uh, hybrid embryos. So <clears throat> when you look at this graph, uh, about 2005, you see a huge jump in the uh, production of hybrid embryos. And since that time, uh, a steady 
uh, increase in hybrid embryo production based on uh, our lab's uh, technology. Uh, last year, they estimate that 350 million hybrid catfish uh, fry were produced. So uh, uh, again, now we revisit this change in farmer efficiency. And in 2020, uh, if we look at the production records, uh, catfish farmers are producing eight and a half times uh, more catfish uh, per hectare than what they were in 1980. Uh, so they continue to improve. You've got producing more and more food on a smaller uh, footprint. Uh, theoretically, that also is more efficient and makes a smaller carbon in imprint. Uh, takes pressure off of natural resources. So aquaculture actually uh, becoming more and more environmentally friendly. And also if you look at that curve, uh, look at about 2005 and we start to see a, a, a steep incline that corresponds with the increased adoption of hybrid catfish. So we have other factors, including the intensive systems that are working hand in hand uh, with the hybrids to improve production. But we can do better. Uh, the strain of uh, channel and blue parent has a strong effect on the production of the F1 embryos. Uh, here's an example where we compared AU1 and AU7 over uh, uh, five, uh, six consecutive years, and AU1 always produced two to three times more hybrid fry. Uh, and that was, of course, that's due to the females. But uh, unfortunately, all males aren't created equal either uh, as well. Uh, so we have an impact uh, due to the strain of blue used also. Then we can take those strain differences and we can improve uh, hybrid embryo production further by selection for females that uh, uh, are, are highly productive. Uh, we can also continue to improve the performance of the hybrids uh, in regards to growth, disease resistance, uh, carcass yield. So different genetic types of hybrids are improved, but there's still differences there. So strain of parent uh, affects hybrid performance. Uh, both of these hybrids here uh, are improved compared to the parents, but using two different types of males and the one with the Rio Grande uh, grows 40% uh, faster than uh, hybrids produced with the other strain of males. Uh, one thing we're working on now is using combining abilities, evaluating that to determine what's the best way to continue to make a better and better channel blue hybrid. In this example, the key is if you look at the pie diagram on the left, uh, the blue shaded area is a general combining ability due to the dams or mothers. And on the, the red shaded area is the combining ability due to the blue catfish sires or males. And what this tells us is that if we select for faster growing channels and faster growing blues, and then hybridize those that will also increase the, the hybrid growth rate. We have a little bit different result when we look at dress out percentage. In this case on the left, you see that the green pie uh, is the major genetic component. This is the specific combining ability. What that means is what we have to do is evaluate different pairs or sets and select for pairs of fish that produce the better performing progeny. And that's how we would improve hybrid performance for this trait. For many years, when we write grants, we complain uh, we're using a wild fish. We really need money so we can uh, make a, a genetically a superior growing fish. Uh, for most major aquaculture species, we can't uh, spin that story anymore. Uh, because if we look, take wild catfish, then we domesticated them, then we selected them, and then we used hybridization and other programs. And if we compare the production of the wild fish to what we have now, it's a 10 to 20 fold difference. But we can continue to do better 
And of course, new aquaculture species have not gone through this story yet. Uh, we're trying to, making the hybrid progeny is uh, very laborious and tedious. So we're trying to look at things like xenogenesis uh, to make uh, embryo production more efficient. Uh, xenogenesis is a method of reproduction in which successive generations differ from each other. It's analogous to human surrogacy. In that case, we can have one woman carrying the embryo that has the genetic material from another mother, I mean, from, an, uh, uh, from another female. So uh, the baby is not genetically related to the uh, birth mother at all. With xenogenesis, we have, so that's what we mean by successive generations are, are different. Uh, in the case of xenogenesis, it's the same concept, but the host is carrying the gonads and the gametes uh, from the donor. Uh, so to do that, we sterilize a, 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 the host generally through triploidy. Uh, triploids are sterile. Uh, the gonad development is atrophied. Uh, the gametes uh, are not viable. And then we isolate stem cells from the blue catfish in this example. And we introduce those to the sterilized host. And in this case, what we're trying to do, we have a xenogenic channel catfish male. Everything about him is channel catfish, except for he produces blue catfish sperm. Therefore, the channel catfish female on the left, she recognizes him as normal, mates, and the product is 100% uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid embryos. Uh, so that would be an improvement on our current technique. We can transfer those stem cells at different life stages, blastula, fry, even subadults. Uh, but the data to date indicates it probably works better with fry uh, sometime shortly after hatching. Now, the Japanese and others have produced xenogenic salmon that when mated together produce pure uh, rainbow trout. And there are uh, xenogenic zebrafish males that depending upon the stem cells introduced, were able to produce sperm from silver danio, goldfish, and even uh, mud loach. So we did have success uh, here on the left. Uh, these are hybrid fingerlings that were produced by mating a xenogenic channel catfish male with a channel catfish female. So you have two channel catfish parents, but all the offspring are hybrids. On the right, to show that I'm not lying, those are the control channel catfish, and you can see the morphological difference. Now, the problem was uh, we were having more and more success uh, but we weren't getting the fertility and the fecundity that would allow uh, commercialization. So we're trying to overcome that problem. You have to have high enough transformation rate, colonization of the cells and proliferation. One aspect we've been looking at is the correct uh, time and development that will give you uh, the highest colonization and, and proliferation of those donor cells. Uh, this is actually a, a <clears throat> graph from xenogenic white catfish, but we have almost an identical uh, illustration with channel catfish. So we can uh, mark these cells with fluorescence and uh, then later, 45, 90 days later, uh, measure uh, the rate of uh, proliferation of those cells. And what we see here is if we injected the stem cells anywhere from zero to 12 days after hatch, uh, when you examine these slides, you can see individual slides, flore uh, uh, cells fluorescing, or sometimes they stick together in clusters. So we're looking at the data two different ways, but in both cases, you can see between four and six days post-hatch, 
we get the greatest number of stem cells that take hold and start growing, which theoretically will result in more fertile, more fecund xenogenic fish. Okay, the next step that we want to look at is molecular genetics. Uh, the latest uh, technology revolves around uh, SNP, single nucleotide polymorphisms, where we're looking at uh, the genetic variation uh, at each individual base. Uh, this technology allows us to do what's called genome-wide association studies, uh, where we can find in the genome which chromosomes, chromosome areas have the uh, primary genes for a certain trait. In this case, we're looking at uh, resistance to uh, Edward Ziella ictaluri, and we see that the it appears that the main genes uh, that affect this trait are on chromosome 1, 12, and 15 of channel catfish. Similar experiment, but for columnaris, and we find there's a different set of genes that have the greatest importance for survival, uh, located on chromosomes 7, 12, and 14. So the next step that we're working on is actually doing marker-assisted selection and genomic selection, where we select for these DNA markers. And uh, in some cases, not all cases, that will actually allow you to make better and faster uh, genetic improvement. We've done a lot of genetic engineering with fish and it looks quite promising. The most common type of research is where in the past is where growth hormone genes have been transferred. With catfish, we can increase growth 50%, uh, maybe even double and triple uh, growth rates with this technique. But with a wide variety of fish, um, you know, 20%, but in some cases, as much as 10 to 30 fold increase in growth has uh, been accomplished. But the, of course, the latter is not a very common uh, result. In the case of catfish and salmon, uh, that growth hormone, uh, increased growth hormone affects muscle structure. So these fish have an increased number of muscle fibers, uh, glycogen globules, mitochondria, but a reduced number of uh, fat globules. Just like selection, we have to be aware of what other traits are affected when our goal is to transform one trait. In this case, you can have pleiotropic effects where one gene affects more than one trait. And the growth hormone channel catfish have uh, better survival at uh, cold temperatures. Uh, growth hormone has a role in osmoregulation. The transgenic catfish <clears throat> also have better resistance to uh, high salinity. Another promising area is the transfer of antimicrobial peptide genes. If we, uh, when we transferred sacropin uh, to channel catfish, we were able to increase bacterial disease resistance, in some cases, two to four fold. Uh, recently, uh, we have looked at, we took different types <clears throat> of antimicrobial peptides and uh, compared them in, in vitro, uh, sacropin, cathelicidin, pluricidin, and an ampicillin antibiotic, and the most promising one was alligator cathelicidin. Uh, we've been able to produce transgenic fish with the cathelicidin gene, and uh, in this case, <clears throat> this data comes from a challenge uh, with uh, where were they being challenged with columnaris, and the cathelicidin transgenics have four to 4.5 times greater survival than the non-transgenic controls. So uh, this, these techniques can increase production, efficiency, and profits. These days, we're always talking about animal welfare, but are we really serious about it? So this is a technique where we can make healthier, fitter animals that have better animal welfare for aquaculture. Uh, but 
as you know, were slow to accept it in society. So by definition, genetically modified organisms are not organic, but if they reduce or eliminate chemical use and antibiotic use, is that not beneficial as what we call truly organic? The things to think about. Now the goals of consumers can be are different often than producers. Uh, rather than production, consumers are interested in healthier, more nutritious and tastier food. So <clears throat> one thing we're examining is omega-3 fatty acid levels. And as, uh, as you know, uh, omega-3 fatty acids have many important human, a long list of uh, human health uh, benefits. Uh, catfish, freshwater catfish have very low levels of omega-3 fatty acids compared to salmon, anchovy, and uh, tuna. So we've been transferring desaturation elongase genes in an attempt to increase omega-3 fatty acids in channel catfish. And uh, we've had success. We want to do better and continue to research in that area. We've been able to increase the omega-3 fatty acid level 30 to 100%. Another important aspect of this is the ratio of the omega uh, fatty acids that you consume also have health effects. Uh, so this also alters the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio uh, in, a, uh, in an improved manner, a more healthy manner. Uh, we're not doing this type of research, but another interesting example, the Canadians transferred the antifreeze protein gene from winter flounder into Atlantic salmon. <clears throat> now, in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, the water is actually below zero C because of the salt. Therefore, uh, the blood fish would die in those environments. But as you know, there are species that survive there. And that's because of the antifreeze protein genes. The Canadians goals, I consider uh, risky transgenic uh, research, because in this case, what their goal was, was to make a salmon that could be cultured closer to the Arctic Circle. By doing that, you're expanding the geographic range and essentially making an exotic species. And if we're worried about environmental risk, uh, exotic species are uh, probably the most risky example in the fish world that we have but they were able to produce salmon that made this antifreeze protein, but it didn't affect uh, cold tolerance. They also experimented with goldfish. It also did not lower the lethal temperature they could survive, but it did increase their survival at the low end of their, their natural temperature tolerance. Uh, 20 years ago, the first uh, commercialization of transgenic fish is ornamental zebra fish, and since that time, several other species. In this case, uh, <clears throat> uh, fluorescent protein genes from jellyfish were transferred, and you create these new colors, and uh, black light at night, you have uh, neon fish uh, swimming around glowing in your aquaria. So I'm not... <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the latest development is gene editing, where we have targeted uh, genetic mutations. So we're trying to disable genes instead of inserting genes. And we have CRISPR technology and others that allows us to uh, take scissors to DNA and, and delete uh, and disable these genes. Uh, myostatin is a muscle regulating uh, protein that prevents us from continuing to grow uh, and grow and grow during a, a mammal's lifetime. And al also it slows down the growth of fish. There are natural mutations of this gene uh, where it doesn't function properly or, or at all, uh, leading to, and these mutations have been found in uh, cattle and dogs, 
where you have this double muscling uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger phenomenon. And there's actually been uh, a handful of humans that have uh, uh, mutated uh, and the myostatin was disabled. So the goal here is, well, what happens if we delete the or disable the myostatin gene from channel catfish? Are we going to end up with a meteor, uh, larger channel catfish? Uh, so uh, our lab members have accomplished that. And uh, during the first uh, 30 days of growth, uh, we obtain about a 30% increase in growth rate. And if you look at the two uh, histology slides in the center, the one on the left is a control, the one on the right is a myostatin mutant. And it's obvious to the naked eye that the myostatin mutant has about 30 to 40% more muscle fibers. Now we've <clears throat> developed F1 fish with this mutation. If you look at the yellow highlighted area, uh, I pinch myself and wonder because the mutants at low density in ponds are growing three times faster than the controls. So we're repeating that with a, a higher density and growing on to, to food fish. Uh, another growth regulator that we're looking at is MC4R, which has a role in fat metabolism as well as growth. And we've uh, learned and others have learned that it actually has a critical role in fish reproduction. Uh, so if we knock out this gene, uh, the fish uh, become, become sterile. And uh, the, the data that we and uh, one other lab has indicates this is, can actually be a major uh, regulator in the HPG axis. Uh, <clears throat> additionally, by knocking out this gene, about 50 to 70% increase in growth can be achieved as well as 50% uh, better feed conversion efficiency. And, uh, and uh, this in, the, in regards to growth, uh, this mutation functions in a recessive manner. If you look at the yellow highlighted area again, uh, the homozygous individuals, uh, that group is the one growing the fastest. Uh, the second one down is a heterozygous and they grow more no differently than the, uh, than the controls. Uh, a, a, a result that surprised us is <clears throat> the MC4 knockouts uh, on, le on the left, if you look at EPA, that omega-3 fatty acid, by knocking out MC4R, we double the, the EPA level, which if we insert the elongase gene from salmon, we get the same doubling of that uh, fatty acid. If we look at DHA, we, by knocking out MC4R, we get a significant increase and uh, but it's not quite as effective as knocking in the elongase. So we have these uh, excellent results for genetic engineering and gene editing, but are we going to impact aquaculture? Are we going to impact food production? Uh, one concern is environmental risk. In order for there to be a risk, these fish would have to be more fit in regards to reproduction, foraging ability, predator avoidance, swimming ability in the natural environment. Uh, the data to date strongly suggests that they are less fit and would likely be outcompeted in the wild. But with today's societal uh, caution and attitude, that's not going to be enough. In order to use these fish, we're going to have to uh, control or confine these. So how do we do that? And not only for transgenics, but other uh, controversial uh, genetic types used in uh, aquaculture. So physical confinement, in my opinion, is not enough because we all learn from Jurassic Park uh, that uh, even though physically confined, uh, some idiot could steal the eggs and spread them, try to spread them throughout the world. So, we want a technique 
where we have total reproductive control. Uh, genetics is maybe the best route to accomplish that. So the fish can only mate when the hatchery manager intervenes. Uh, one approach is actually transgenic. In this case, what we're doing is inserting a gene, uh, usually a short hairpin RNAi uh, gene that knocks out or prevents the expression of primordial germ cells, which are critical. They're the precursor for gametes. So if you destroy those, the fish uh, cannot produce eggs or sperm. Uh, this is uh, obviously the top fish. This is normal sexual development of a channel catfish male. Bottom is obviously a female. Uh, here we have some fish <clears throat> with the transgenic knockout females. Either the ovaries do not exist or there's no ova developing inside. Uh, here are a couple males. One of them has no testes at all, and the other one uh, greatly atrophied uh, tes testes. So <clears throat> we can't have a farm if all of our fish are sterile. So we have to be able to reverse that sterility in a sample of embryos so that we can grow some brood stock. So these constructs, these transgenes are designed so that we can add a compound to the hatching water that will turn that sterilizing gene off and allow normal development. And the top fish, in this case, we're using a gene that we can uh, turn off with application of copper sulfate. So the top fish is a transgenic fish hatched without copper sulfate, <clears throat> low levels. And the bottom fish is a, a, a transgenic fish with a sterilizing gene, but that gene's been disabled by hatching in, in copper. And we see the fantastic ovarian development. One problem though, uh, these transgenic fish without gonads, apparently they're important for growth. Uh, so we saw a 25% decrease in growth and survival. This may have been due to the fact that they were <clears throat> in head-to-head -head competition with uh, more aggressive controls. And we have preliminary data that indicates we might be able to correct this problem uh, through selection. Another option is gene editing again, but in this case, uh, targeting reproductive genes, uh, followed by hormone therapy to restore fertility. <clears throat> Again, we use CRISPR technology to target and mutate those reproductive genes, uh, such as LH, FSH, uh, and GNRH. So <clears throat> then we can take a normal uh, spawning hormones like HCG, LHRH, and spawn the fish. Uh, <clears throat> they can only reproduce uh, through the intervention of the, the hatchery manager again. Uh, some of these fish uh, can produce, uh, can uh, ovulate and spermiate, but the uh, gametes are not viable. So on the left, we have eggs from a uh, sterilized female, and they uh, were non-viable, so the fungus is attacking and destroying them. On the right, we have a sister who's been hormone spawn, and now uh, the eggs are, are fertile and developing normally. Again, we need to be concerned uh, that were uh, affecting other important commercial traits. On the left, we have different uh, HPG axis knockouts, and they are uh, growing as, depending upon the knockout, they're growing as well or better than controls. <clears throat> For added uh, redundancy and security, we tried making some double, uh, triple, and quadruple knockouts. In this case, some of the fish actually are growing slower at the same rate, or some 
uh, triple knockouts are growing faster than the controls. Of course, uh, so we can, uh, we're very close to having total control of these fish, um, but the next major hurdle is public acceptance. Uh, the issues there are politics, government regulation, environmental risk, uh, education, and food safety. Uh, so the, we, there's different terms, transgenic, GMO, genetically engineered, bioengineered, and then of course, uh, uh, gene edited. This technology can benefit the farmer, the processor, and also the consumer, but the controversy is, is it safe? So the, uh, uh, when we apply, one, one concern is, well, if I eat a growth hormone fish, you know, is it the same as taking steroids? Well, we apply insulin and growth hormone to correct medical defects. We do it by injection or nasal sprays instead of oral because the digestive process is going to destroy the DNA. Otherwise, if we ate a carrot or a pig, uh, we'd become a pig man or a carrot man. And obviously that doesn't occur. Now these <clears throat> major scientific organizations, uh, US National Academy of Science, Royal Society of London, FAO, WHO, uh, and even the European Food Safety Authority, which uh, bans all genetically engineered food, all of these organizations have done analysis and concluded that in all, almost all cases, transgenic, there's no logical reason why there would be a safety issue with transgenic meat. But there is <clears throat> one thing that we do need, we need to treat each, be responsible and treat these on a case by case basis. Uh, the main safety consideration is allergenicity. So if we took a peanut, corn, or shrimp gene <clears throat> that produced a protein that was responsible for the allergic uh, uh, response in people who have that problem, then we could uh, theoretically produce a transgenic food that would be a health risk for those particular people. Uh, Another pro hurdle we have to overcome is the anti-GMO movement. And this is a career. This is a job. If you go online, these organizations are soliciting donations, even if they do not want the public to accept this technology. Some of them have 30-year careers. <clears throat> if the technology was approved and accepted, they no longer have a job. Now, another problem we overcome is human nature is to be leery of radically new technologies. This is a painting from 1802 <clears throat> that's a propaganda material used from the 1802 Anti-Vaccine Society. Most of us would probably agree that vaccine technology has had a very positive effect on humanity. But the message they're sending here, we have a line of people from uh, 220 years ago, they're getting, taking vaccine and within minutes, they start growing horns and they have cows growing out of different parts of their, their body. And obviously that's uh, ridiculous. Even the automobile was met with uh, resistance. There were laws or proposed laws when they first came out uh, saying you needed to have someone walk in front of the car waving a red flag. Uh, some places had two to four mile per hour speed limits. There were laws proposed that said if you saw a horse coming, you didn't want to make the horse afraid. So you needed to hide the car 
take it apart, wait till the horse passed, and then reassemble the car and continue your journey. Uh, obviously, uh, there's no reason to have cars if you have those laws. And uh, but, but perhaps in retrospect, uh, maybe we should have been more concerned about the automobile. In some cases, we have political agendas to overcome. Uh, the Alaskan congressmen openly admit they're trying to protect their clientele. They're anti-aquaculture. And of course, therefore, they're also anti-GMO <clears throat> because they're trying to eliminate the competition for the commercial Alaskan fishermen. But a, a huge obstacle we're all involved in is public education. <clears throat> the, the vast majority of people really don't understand where their food comes from. They don't understand biology and they have even more trouble with genetics. <clears throat> The two ladies on the right are two of my daughters. <clears throat> the one on the far right is Amy. When I uh, wrote my first book, she was 16. I gave a copy of the book to all of my children. About two months later, I, I asked her what she would thought of, about it. Now, <clears throat> she uh, ended her education with an associate's degree, and she was a... Uh, She was a straight A student her entire academic career. So she's an intelligent, educated person. Uh, she also has a very wry sense of humor and uh, must have had a bad experience with freshman biology. She told, when I asked her if she, how she liked my book, she said, well, dad, <clears throat> I opened the book the first word that I saw was allele, so I closed the book. So this is the education that uh, a large part of the public has been bombarded with through the years. Um, another interesting example is the Jimmy Kimmel show uh, had an episode where they interviewed West Coast uh, grocery shoppers. They asked them what they thought about GMOs. And of course they all said, oh man, that's so horrible. I would never eat such a thing. So then they asked them, well, what is a GMO? Nobody could define what GMO stood for. Uh, Thomas Hoban in North Carolina did a very interesting uh, study regarding genetically engineered food in 1994. <clears throat> now he knew because of this propaganda, he needed another way to evaluate the, the data, why people were answering the way they were. So he asked two additional questions. He asked them, if you've ever, have you ever eaten a hybrid fruit or vegetable? And 60% responded, no. Then he asked, is it ethical to eat a hybrid fruit or vegetable? About 60% of North Carolinians, and you know, this is a rural, basically a rural state, said no. Of course, we have all eaten hybrid fruits and vegetables. That's quite common. He also did an international study and he asked a true false question. Ordinary tomatoes do not contain genes while genetically modified ones do. If you just guess, 50% of the people could get it right. The Canadians were the only ones that hit that 50% just by guessing. United States was only 45%. But Austria, France, Germany, Italy, 32 to 35% of the people could answer that question correctly. Obviously, they could have done better with a random guess or drawing marbles out of a hat. So <clears throat> uh, we do have a transgenic meat on the market now. The first one, as most of you are aware, 
or growth hormone transgenic fish, Aqua Advantage produced by Aqua Bounty. So fish was the first one to reach the market. Uh, FDA approved these fish for consumption in 2015, but they were not marketed for several years uh, because of uh, labeling problems uh, and laws that uh, uh, were activated to, to prevent their import. About the same time, the Canadians also approved them. And uh, I don't have an exact figure, but uh, uh, approximately 20 metric tons or so have been uh, sold in Canada. Aquabounty eventually got approval to grow these in the United States and their first US grown uh, transgenic salmon are uh, on the market in the United States, uh, have been on the market, I believe for a few months now. Now, in order for that to happen, the US had to enact labeling laws. Uh, the anti-GMO people are really upset with those laws uh, because there's a variety of ways that you're able to label it. And uh, this particular technique, instead of having a red label that says genetically engineered, it's a green label that says bioengineered. And uh, obviously they uh, disagree with that approach. So now we have gene editing and some countries uh, tightly regulate uh, this new technology where we're, instead of putting DNA in, we're removing DNA, we're disabling DNA. Um, <clears throat> so some countries have uh, fairly lenient laws, others very strict. Uh, there's two lines of thought. Sometimes regulation is triggered by the process and sometimes by the product. In America, the first thing that triggers regulation is process. So for example, you could have a fish with a natural mutation. And if you were to recreate that very same mutation with gene editing and the two fish were identical, even though they are totally identical, the artificially produced one is going to be regulated. The other one is not because of the process. Uh, <clears throat> gene edited fish have been commercialized for the first time. Uh, Aqua Bounty again is there. Uh, it's probably myostatin edited uh, Nile tilapia that are being marketed in Argentina. The, so we have a suite of genetic tools that we can use. Uh, my uh, hypothesis prediction is in the future, all of our aquacultured organisms will be developed by <clears throat> multiple uh, sets of, of genetic tools. So instead of having so just selected fish or just triploid fish, you may have selected triploid hybrids, uh, sex reverse transgenics, et cetera. To build the best house, we'll need to use as many tools as possible to address different traits. Uh, thank you very much. It's not the end, it's only the beginning. <clears throat>